Raphael is going to tell us about uh, scaling algorithms. So thanks for inviting me, and uh, it's been a great workshop so far. So I hope I live up to the task here. My talk is much easier than the previous one. So hopefully, you know, sit down, relax. So, uh, <laughs> so OK, so today I'll talk about scaling algorithms and deterministic approximation of capacity and uh, the Braskem Lieb constant. And you know, this is beyond randomization because I don't know any randomized algorithm. Well, deterministic is a randomized algorithm where you don't use randomness, but you know, purely like better uh, randomized algorithm to compute, like the BL constant, for example. So the outline for today is I'll talk about some scaling problems, then I'll give you some algorithms, and I'll show you how these approximate the permanent and capacity, and then we switch gears and start talking about Brask and Bleep, and then we conclude and pose some open problems, okay? So, but, you know, beyond even randomized algorithm or even beyond just these two topics that I talk about, why should anyone care about like scaling problems, even if you don't know what they are yet, right? So they have applications everywhere, so in communication complexity, algorithms, optimization, quantum information theory, um, algebraic complexity, representation theory, and you know, so on. So you, know, uh, you should care about this, okay? Let me give you, um, I may not stay much in motivation, but let me just give you a very simple scaling problem, okay? Which is the matrix scaling problem. Suppose I give you an n by n non-negative matrix A, okay? And I say that this matrix is doubly stochastic if this row sums and the column sums are all one. Okay? So here's an example of a doubly stochastic matrix. Okay? And I say that oops, B is a scaling of A if there are positive in, uh, real numbers, x1 up to xn and y1 up to yn, such that Bij is equal to xi, aij, yj. So this means that the xi's are going to multiply the rows and the yi's are going to multiply the columns. Okay? So A has a doubly stochastic scaling if there is a doubly stochastic matrix uh, scaling B of this matrix A. Okay, so for example, this matrix here okay, is a matrix A. It has a doubly stochastic scaling because, well, here's my scaling factors, and I obtain the first matrix. Okay? So, but now, uh, algorithmically speaking, we're not interested so much in the exact doubly stochastic scaling problem. We're interested in the approximate doubly stochastic problem. So, and what do I mean by an approximate doubly stochastic matrix? Let's just see, let's just have this measure of distance from a matrix A from being doubly stochastic. And what is this? This Ri is the uh, ith row sum of A, the Cj is the jth column sum, and I'm just seeing how, how far I am from being doubly stochastic, okay? So this is the doubly stochastic distance. And the question now is, A has an approximate doubly stochastic scaling if for all epsilon, there is a scaling B epsilon of A such that this matrix B epsilon is epsilon close to being doubly stochastic. Okay? Now, you know, in computer science, we, we see this problem and we say, well, when does A have an approximate doubly stochastic scaling and can we find it efficiently? Okay, so these are the questions we're going to be um, interested in. So, okay, and why does the approximate problem is more important? There are two reasons, one computational and one more geometric, okay? For those of you who have seen this talk before, you know, uh, yes, I apologize, but I will go through this again. So the first example is computational, right? Like, we cannot spit out, like, ir like irrational numbers with a computer, so, you know, you can never hope to obtain this doubly stochastic scaling. You will, you're always going to get something really close computationally. But geometrically, what can happen is that you can have this matrix here, okay? And this matrix, okay? It would always approximate. There's a scaling that always approximates a doubly stochastic scaling. But you'll never be able to get the exact doubly stochastic scaling because you can never make this entry here from non zero to zero, right? Because you're only multiplying by positive numbers, okay? So only in the limit uh, you will get this, okay? But, you know, now I hope I motivated that the approximate problem is much more interesting than the exact problem. And let me just show you an algorithm, which is very simple. So suppose I give you this matrix, n by n, and I ask, is there epsilon scaling to w stochastic? I also give you epsilon. Okay, how do we find it? And you know, people in the 30s uh, already just did the naive algorithm that you would think. Okay, so I pick my matrix A. If it's not row stochastic, if my rows are not one, simply make the rows one, okay? But now you messed up the columns. And now what do you do? Well, let's just fix the columns again. But then you mess up the rows. What do you do? Well, repeat this many times. 
And if at any point you get very close to doubly stochastic, you output this doubly stochastic scaling. Or, you know, if at, some, if at no point, you know, you have a k times there. If at no point you got close, you say, well, there's no scaling. Now the only thing that's left to do is to prove that this works, right? But, I mean, three questions that we have is, one, are we making progress at all? And how do we know when to stop? So how, which case should we choose so that this algorithm is correct? And the third question is, well, is there some epsilon zero that if I can get epsilon zero close to doubly stochastic, okay, I can get close to doubly stochastic for any epsilon? Because maybe, you know, you want some really high precision and, you know, maybe I just need to test something before just to decide whether you can achieve that precision. Okay, so let me just run this algorithm for you with two examples so we can see when does it work and when does it fail. Right, so okay, first I give you this matrix. Okay, now let's just scale the rows. Okay, now the matrix is row stochastic. Now, but I broke up the columns. And then again, I scale, and then now I normalize the columns and I broke up the rows. Okay, and I keep doing this. And you see where this is going, right? I'm never gonna get close. So now, suppose that I give you the second matrix here, okay? Now we do, we scale the rows, okay, but now we messed up the columns. Then we scale the columns, messed up the rows, and we keep doing this. Notice that these denominators are always, you know, decreasing, which is a good thing, and these numbers are, you know, becoming smaller as well. And then at some point, I'm going to obtain this matrix, okay? So this is a row uh, stochastic, but it's very close in the column scaling. So one, in one example, I converge to a doubly stochastic matrix. The other one, I'll never get to a doubly stochastic matrix. So how can we distinguish between these two cases? Are these the only two? Okay. So the observation here is that in the first example, we have no matchings. Right. And therefore, we have a whole blocker, which is this big block of zeros here. Right. In the second case, I have a matching. Okay. So... Are these the only bad cases when I have no matching? So if I have a matching, can I always scale to doubly balanced? Okay, so let me show you the analysis of this, uh, which was done by Linnaeus, Morodinitsky, and Wigderson in 2000. And the analysis is as follows. Well, let's pick the permanent of A, okay? So if I have a matching, right, my permanent is bigger than zero, right, because permanent is the sum of product of all matchings. And suppose that you know, my, my, the entries of my matrix A, they are all bounded by one over nu, okay? So if I have one matching, right, if my permanent is bigger than zero, then my permanent is bigger than this nu to the minus n, right? Because it's just the product of the entries of the matching, okay? Now, if I'm far from being doubly stochastic, okay, then they show that when you normalize, if you normalize the rows of the columns, okay, my permanent, the value of my scale matrix, okay, the permanent of that matrix, it will increase by a factor of e to the e, or e to the epsilon, okay? And we know that the permanent is less than or equal to one for any normalized matrix, right? Because the permanent is less than the product of the row sums, right? So therefore, I can just choose k to be polynomial n over epsilon, and this will suffice, right? So it decides whether a matrix can be scaled to double stochastic or not, okay? Um, great. And we know that, you know, permanent is bigger than zero if and only if A has a matching. So, you know, those two cases are the only cases, right? And the algorithm is correct. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. Now, how do we bound this epsilon zero? Remember, there was the third question. Okay. What epsilon zero should we choose that if you have epsilon zero, you can always scale, right? Well, you know, permanent of A is equal to zero if and only if A has no matching and has a Hall blocker. Okay, so now let me just do a very simple proof. You know, since we talked so much about hard things in the previous talk, let's just see a simple thing, right? So if my matrix A, okay, has a big block of zeros, okay, let's say that here, I mean, what is the big block of zeros? Is that, you know, if this dimension is i, this dimension is j, you just have the i plus j uh, is bigger than n, which means that just i is bigger than n minus j, okay? Now let's name these columns C1 up to CI, and these rows here, R1 up to Rn minus J. Okay. okay? Well, we know, right, because I mean, these are non-negative, right? So we know that the sum of Ri's, well, not I is a bad letter here, Rk's, right, is greater than or equal than the sum of the columns. 
right? Put k here as well, right? Because the sum of these columns here, you have zero, you have only these entries, and the sum of the rows you have these entries plus something that's maybe a non-negative, right? So suppose that um, I set my epsilon naught to be equal to one over two n squared. Okay. So I claim that no matrix that has this big block, okay, can get this close to being doubly stochastic. Okay. Why? Because if you could, right, what would happen? You know that the sum of ci minus one squared, uh, not ci, sorry, ck minus one squared, it would be less than one over two n squared, right? Which means that, well, all of your ck's, they are between uh, one over two n plus one, one minus one over two n, right? So in particular, this is bigger. Remember, this is k equals to one up to i, and this is k equals to one up to n minus j, right? So in particular, this is the same for the rows, right? So the rows are also in this range. So then now, what does this mean? This is the same as, this is bigger than i, one minus one over two n, and this is less than n minus j, one plus one over two n, right? But since these are integers and you have this inequality, okay, this cannot hold, okay? So you know you have a really good bound. Your bound is very small, okay, in this case. So that's how you bound uh, epsilon naught. Okay, so we solved all of our questions for matrix scaling, okay? And it's an easy problem, so you're all pretty bored right now. So let's get to a harder problem, okay? So now let's get to quantum operators, which is a generalization of the matrix scaling problem. So a quantum operator can be given by any map, okay, that maps complex matrices, okay, n by n matrices to n by n matrices, given by a tuple of matrices, A1 up to AM, such that T of X is equal to this quantity here, AI, X, AI, conjugate transpose, okay? The only thing I wanted to get out of it is that it, ma it takes positive semi-definite matrices to positive semi-definite matrices. Okay, no quantum things um, required here. Okay, and the dual of this map, okay, if you have just the Hermitian linear product here, right, this dual map is given essentially by just flipping this uh, A conjugate dagger here. So it's the sum of AI conjugate transpose X AI. Okay, so this is the dual map. And now, since I defined this, and I'm going to tell you that this is a generalization of matrix scaling, you ask first, well, what is the analog of scaling here? And what is the analog of doubly stochastic for these quantum operators? Okay, and here's the definition of doubly stochastic. So my quantum operator is going to be doubly stochastic if the identity is a fixed point of both T and the dual map. Okay, so if both Ti and T dual of I, they map to the identity. Now, what is the scaling? A scaling of this map T consists of two invertible matrices now. Okay, remember, I had before diagonal matrices in the matrix scaling, but now I have um, invertible matrices, such that I multiply all of the matrices AI simultaneously on the left by L and on the right by R. Okay, so it's this left-right multiplication. And what is the analog of distance to doubly stochastic? Well, my distance to doubly stochastic is how far I am from being doubly stochastic. And here I have the L2 norm if you think of these matrices as a vector. Okay. So far, so good. Okay. Now, again, we say that T, the operator T, has an approximate doubly stochastic scaling. If for every epsilon, there exists this matrix is L epsilon R epsilon, such that the scaled operator has distance to doubly stochastic less than or equal to epsilon. Okay? Same setting. And again, we can ask the same questions. When does A, when does my operator T, which I'll denote by this tuple of matrices now, have an approximately doubly stochastic scaling? And can we find it efficiently? Okay, you can also ask about the epsilon naught, okay? Uh, but I would just, uh, we can solve it as well, but, uh, okay. yes? What, does the, what is the set of doubly stochastic quantum operators? Is it a nice set in this vector space? In this vector space? I mean, you know, it's in a vector sum subset in a very large dimensional vector space. Is yeah, it yeah. A convex set? Is it a polytope? Is it uh -huh. But you want it to be PSD, no? You want the matrices, so it's a spectral heat. No, no, you're in a vector space, right? Like the, these are, I mean, you can consider this as essentially being like MN to the 
to the well, M. In the original case, doubly stochastic had a non-negativity constraint. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you pose the right non-negativity constraint, it should be a spectral unit. Yeah, plus the yeah. MF positive semi-definite to positive semi Right, right, yeah, yeah. So, okay, so now let's see how this generalizes the matrix scaling, okay? And this would just be a nice, easy exercise that we'll, we're going to come back to it later when we talk about brass complete. So, okay, how does this generalize matrix scaling? Simply take this quantum operator given by this, the matrices AI are going to be root of A11 times the elementary matrix uh, E11, so 11 in the entry 11, root of A12, E12, you get the pattern. And the dual map will simply be the A transpose, right? What you get from the A transpose. So now you have A2, root of A21 multiplied by E12. Okay, so it's a very easy exercise. Uh, and then now let's look at what is TA when you apply it to the identity, okay? So TA when you apply it to identity, you know, is this quantity here, okay? Which if you sum, you only get like sum of AIJ times EII, which means that you know, in the first diagonal, you get the row sums of your matrix. And, you know, in the entry i, you get the uh, sum of the row i. Okay? And the dual, you can see that you get the column sums in the diagonal. Okay? So, simple exercise. And so, the distance to w stochastic of this operator TA is exactly the matrix distance to w stochastic. Okay? So, you can see how this is a generalization of matrix scaling. And you can say, well, but the group action here now, maybe you have more freedom. But you can show that, you know, essentially, if you act on the group on these matrices, you only need to use diagonal matrices as well. So, you know, it's essentially a strict generalization. Now, um, okay, so we have our problem. Now let's get to the algorithmic problem. So I give you an operator, which I give you by uh, the vector of matrices, A1 up to AM. And let's assume that these matrices now have integer coefficients, okay? and uh, epsilon is bigger than zero, then can T be epsilon scaled to W stochastic? And if yes, let's find it. So, you know, Gurwitz, after lots of generalizations, right, he came up with this problem, and he also came up with the algorithm, which is, well, again, repeat K times. Okay. So if my T of I is different from the identity, let's just normalize it. So how do you normalize? You multiply on the left all of the matrices by some invertible matrix, to make T of I equals to the identity, okay? Now, you're gonna mess up the dual. Once you mess up the dual, what do you do? Well, normalize the dual, okay? And make T dual of I equals to I. And you keep repeating this, okay? Uh, and if at any point you get close to epsilon, close to W stochastic, you output the current scaling. Otherwise, you just output no scaling. And then now the question is, well, which K should we choose? Right? So. Okay, so how does the analysis go? Gurvitz also, uh, you know, generalizing all the previous analysis, he was like, okay, let's do the following. Let's come up with a potential function. Remember, in the last, uh, in matrix scaling, our potential function was the permanent itself, but then Gurvitz had to come up with a different potential function, which is what he called the capacity, because it generalizes his capacity for hyperbolic polynomials. Um, so actually, it was before capacity for hyperbolic Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, it, Yes. Um, okay, yes, it's an orthogonal generalization of the basic capacity, the first capacity, right? Like it, the first two. So, um, and the capacity is the following. Take the infimum over the determinant of T of X divided by the determinant of X for all overall positive definite matrices. Okay. If you know, um, so Gurvitz also analyzed the the matrix scaling problem by using this other function that he called capacity. So let me show you how this is a generalization of that notion. So his capacity for a matrix, okay, so is equal to the infimum overall x1 up to xn bigger than zero of ax. Once you multiply, take the ith coordinate of this guy and take the product over all of them, okay, and divide by the product of xi. Okay. That was the first Gurwitz capacity, and this capacity generalizes that one that, was that can also be used to analyze the matrix scaling. And Gurwitz came up with this capacity, and he said, okay, if capacity is bigger than zero, remember for the permanent, right? If the permanent was bigger than zero, it was lower bounded by something nice, 
some inverse exponential. And then Gurvitz said, well, if capacity is bigger than zero, then capacity is bigger than I don't know, right? And, but he showed that if the distance of W stochastic is big and you normalize, then your capacity will also grow in the same way by this e to the epsilon, OK? And it's easy to see from this definition that the capacity of t is less than or equal to 1 for normalized operators, right? Because you can simply put the identity here. This will give you 1, and that's it, right? So now all is left is to give a lower bound on, on this capacity. And he was able to give a lower bound on some, on some cases for this capacity, but he was not able to give the lower bound for overall cases, okay? for all types of, of, of operators. So, OK. So now, and in, you know, in our first work, what we did in 2015 was to, if the capacity is bigger than 0, then we give this nice lower bound, e to the minus poly n, okay? which is all we needed for our algorithm to work. Okay? This is the starting point of all this scaling business for us. OK. But I mean, the thing is, yeah? Is there an analysis of this algorithm that uses some potential that's more like the permanent? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so that there is, and, and if I, so I was, this talk was supposed to be 45 minutes. The organizers gave me 15 minutes more, and if I, if I have the 15 minutes, Gurvitz can talk about what is the permanent, yeah. Can you say a word about the choice of R and C? Huh? So in the algorithm, choosing R and C plays uh -huh. a role. Can you say something about that? How do you, what are good choices? Does it matter? No, I mean, you just essentially, you, you just really normalize, um, you know, I mean, once you get your ti, I mean, your, the i that you the r that you choose to normalize will be the inverse square root of the of this guy, right? So it's a canonical already, like it, yeah, yeah. So okay, but then I mean, the other question that we need to figure out is, well, when can we scale? I mean, when is this capacity uh, bigger than zero? Right? I mean, well, we have to show first that if capacity is like if you can scale, then your capacity will be bigger than zero, right? So when can we scale? OK, so in matrix scaling, we saw that you can scale if and only if you don't have this huge block of zeros, right? There's no whole block, or if you have a matching. Is there an analog in the operator scaling case? And Gurvitz in 2005, he you know, um, provided this, this condition to us, OK? And the condition is as follows. So this tuple of matrix, matrices is, set, is called rank non-decreasing if and only if for all vector spaces, OK, for all subspaces of the complex, you have that the dimension of this space, when you take the union over all AIs applied to V, this dimension is bigger than the dimension of your origi original space. So what does it mean? Well, it really means that you're not shrinking any subspace, right? So you have your big complex space here, Cn, and you have your space V. Once you apply all of them, all of the AIs, okay, to V, you get a bigger space, right? So the dimension of this space is strictly, or at least as big, as v, okay. So, and he proved that, you know, given my operator, given my quantum operator, then the capacity is bigger than zero if and only if this matrix is a rank non-decreasing. Okay. So that's a combinatorial condition that gives you the capacity bigger than zero. And the cool observation here that if you know some invariant theory, you know that essentially what we're doing here is Hilbert Mumford. Okay. But since we didn't know invariant theory at that point, we didn't know. You know, and Gurvitz didn't know he was doing Hilbert Mumford, right? So it's, uh, so A1 up to AM is rank decreasing, which means that there is a space that gets shrunk if and only if in some basis they have a common, all, all these matrices have a common Hall blocker, right? Because simply, I, if my matrices are rank decreasing, I just look at my spaces after a change of basis, all of those matrices will have to have a huge block of zeros, okay? So this is a generalization of this Hall blocker and it's not an accident, okay? So, okay, now we have this condition, and how do we lower bound the capacity? Can we use this condition somehow to lower bound the capacity? Okay, so quick reminder, what is the capacity? Remember, the capacity is the infimum over all the determinants of t of x, such that the determinant of x is equal to 1. Let's just normalize, right? And what we want to prove is that the capacity of t is bigger than 0 implies that the capacity of t is lower bounded by this inverse exponential. Now, let me give you... Again, matrix is an integer. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. It's very important to it's very important to say that you know these matrices are inte integral. Exactly. Otherwise, I mean, you can get as close as you want from from being zero. Integers in the real field. 
you don't have the kind of discreteness you, you know to fix it up? No, I should uh, walk course. But just by putting in beddings, uh, it would be interesting to see. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Well, we can talk about it maybe. You can ask me these questions in a little bit You can later. Also phrase it differently. You can say, how does the capacity depend on the matrices, right? This lower bound. I mean, you, if you say the integers, then you get this bound that only depends on. Oh, no, yeah, yeah. I mean, at some point, you're going to use an integer which is not zero as at least one. Yeah, yes, exactly. And no, no, I mean, yeah, that, that, yeah, we, we, yeah, we can prove, we can, give, we can give bounds. I mean, it's a function of the entries of the matrices, right? So Some we just need this. Yeah, the one is just going to be like coming the exponent here. Yeah, yeah, so that's not uh, So, OK, let's do the basic case that Leonid did, OK? So suppose, like, what is the easiest case of a rank non-decreasing tuple of matrices, OK? Is that, let's say that one of these matrices, let's say A1, is invertible. Then you know you're not shrinking the rank of anyone, right? Because V gets mapped to some other you know, space of dimension, just the same. So in this case, we know that T of X, OK, is bigger in this positive semi-definite sense uh, than this matrix, A1, X, A1 dagger, right? We know because they're just removing the other sums, right? Which implies that the determinant of TX is greater, greater or equal than the determinant of a1, x, a1 transpose, conjugate transpose, right? So in this case, well, since the determinant of x is 1, you know, and we know, well, the determinant of this guy is equal to the determinant of a1 squared, and a1 squared, a1 is an integral matrix, we know that this quantity is greater than or equal to 1, okay? So if I have one invertible matrix, I'm done, right? I know how to lower bound capacity. Okay, now, what is the next best, like, the next basic case? Suppose that A1 up to AM span an invertible matrix, which Leonid also did in his paper, okay? Then an easy lemma is, if I pick a unitary matrix B, okay, in CM or a CM, okay? Then, you know, uh, if I make these matrices CI, which are the sums, which are the linear combinations with the coefficients of the ith row of the matrix B, okay? Then this operator here, TB, okay, is equal to my operator T of X. Okay, this change of basis preserves my operator. My quantum operator is exactly the same. Okay, so now if they span an invertible matrix, then you can cook up a unitary matrix B. Okay, so and these guys like where the first row, all of the elements are rational and they have a small denominator. Okay, such that C1. Okay, is this linear combination of AJs, which is an invertible matrix. So essentially, you can make an invertible matrix okay, with some integer coefficients, which is nice. Okay, or rational coefficients, but the denominator is very small. So once you have this matrix, you know that T of X is equal to this uh, operator after a change of basis. Okay? But now this operator, remember, we fall back to the case where we have only one uh, invertible matrix. right? So then... You know, the determinant of T of X is greater or equal than the determinant of this, uh, of C1 squared, okay? But now C1 squared is a rational matrix, the denominator is Q, so you have that, you know, my capacity is bigger than 1 over Q to the 2N, which is fine, right? Okay, so these are the two basic cases. Now, what about the general case, where TX is rank non-decreasing? What do we do in this case? Just this you have a question, Leonid? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So actually, uh, it was done different, not the way that. Uh, so it actually, it was done using that potential function, which is like permanent, using that what they what this Sasha say, Kelly, but it's uh, quantum permanent. <laughs> so uh, and uh, you can get uh, so that thing is always it's either zero or integer, and that is responsible for existence of that uh, no, 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 non-singular matrix, okay? And there is a relationship between capacity and that guy, and it's kind of tricky. Yeah, so since that proof is tricky, you know, I didn't fit in this slide, but yeah, it was done differently back no, then. No, relationship, proof is easy, relationship <laughs> strange, okay, not yes. strange. Um, okay, so the general case is, so the T is rank non-decreasing, right? So. Okay, and now, uh, to finish the proof, now we need to, you know, cook up a different operator that we can bound the capacity, okay? Because, well, you know, we need to somehow 
prove we did somehow, you know, if T is rank non-decreasing, the strategy now is, well, I showed you two basic cases, right? So I mean, I hope that is to reduce to those basic cases. So how can we come up from an operator? I take this, this operator T. I want to come up with another operator such that the capacity of this other operator is smaller than my capacity of T, right? But at the same time, that operator has some invertible matrix in their span, right? That's how we continue to like, generalize this proof. OK, so now for, to do that, I'll just define what is a tensor of two quantum operators, OK? So if I have two operators, T1 and T2, of different dimensions, OK? And they're given like Ti is given by sum of Aij, x, Aij, and I'm summing over j now. i is 1 or 2. Define this operator T1, 2 as the tensor of T1 and T2. And this operator T1, 2 is given by the matrices A1i tensor A2j. So if I have A1 up to AM and B1 up to BM, my new operator, you take all the pairs and you tensor them. OK, so that's my new quantum operator. OK, so it's an easy lemma just by definition, but just by the definition of capacity, which is an infimum over a bunch of things, that the capacity of this operator, of this new operator T1, 2, is less than or equal than the capacity of the first operator T1 to the power n2 times the capacity of the operator T2 to the power n1. OK, I can show this since uh, I mean, it's very um, So, I mean, what is the definition of the capacity for T12, right? So it's the infimum over all y such that the determinant of y is equal to 1, right? And, you know, y is positive definite of dimension n1, n2, right? And then I have what? The determinant of this T of y, T12 of y. But what is T12 of y? It's essentially sum of... Ai tensor Bj, my y, Ai tensor Bj, conjugate transpose, right? But this infimum, right, is less than or equal than if I take the infimum over all matrices. Um, so let me put x here, sorry. And if I take y, which is n1 by n1, and if I take z, which is uh, positive definite of dimension n2, the determinants of these two are, you know, uh, 1. And I take the determinant over sum of ai tensor bj. And here, instead of having x, I have only x's of a specific form. And this x is exactly like x tensor y. Sorry, is y tensor z. Right, and you can see how this is splits exactly into the capacity of the first one, which is T1 to the N2 times the capacity of T2 to the N1. Okay, so this just comes from the definition of infimum, right? I'm just taking a subset. So, the cool thing is there is equality here. Yes, the cool thing, which is harder to prove, is that this is actually equal. Okay, so, but I, we don't need that for the proof, right? We only need the really easy side. So to get a good lower bound on the capacity now is enough to say that if my t is rank non-decreasing, I can come up with a, some other operator t prime for some dimension d, okay? And my dimension needs to be exponential, okay? Such that t tensor t prime has an invertible matrix in their span, right? Because then we know how to lower bound the capacity of this operator, and I know this bound, okay? Yeah? Good. Question so far? And you need the entries of T prime to be not too big. Right, and I need and I need right, and I need the matrices that define my, my operator T to be integral, let's say. Yeah, not too big. Uh, okay. And for that we need some invariant theory. Okay, so underlying all this, you know, finding this invertible matrix, there is some invariant theory going on. So let me just give you a basic uh, invariant theory for this setting, which is I give you a group G, okay, think of G as being SLN squared. And it acts on A1 up to AN by this left right multiplication that we had before. OK? So notice I changed the group a little bit, but you know, it's essentially everything is, is the same. So, OK, I'm acting on this matrix by left right multiplication. And the null cone problem, OK, is the following. Given this vector of matrices, OK, is there a sequence of scalings, of left and right scalings, such that at this limit, the, the whole 
all of these matrices go to zero, okay? Can I scale these points all the way down to zero? This is the null cone problem, okay? This is defined by Hilbert back then in much more generality uh, or much less generality, depends on how you see it. Um, and as a result by, uh, you know, Dirks and, and Wyman, uh, Zubkov, okay, I have the names here. Oh, I don't have the names. Okay, so, so all these people, they prove that, you know, this tuple of matrices is in the null cone, if and only if this tuple of matrices is rank non-decreasing, okay? But one cool thing about it is that these matrices, this tuple of matrices is rank non-decreasing, if and only if this determinant of sum of AI tensor BI for any matrices BI that you pick, okay, of the same dimension, is equal to zero, okay, for all the BIs. So it's an if and only if. So if my operator is rank increasing, then it must be the case that there exists some Bs for some dimension, okay, such that this determinant will be non-zero. And what does that mean? That means that this tensor operator that I constructed will have a, an invertible matrix in their span. The integrality is gone. The integrality is gone, but for a computer science it's not because this determinant is a polynomial. I mean, if you think of this determinant as a determinant as a polynomial with coefficients in these matrices bi, if there are coefficients, right? If your polynomial is non-zero, then if you, you know, plug it in values from a large enough grid, right, like you, you will find a non-zero there, so, so you're right? Which is essentially the fundamental theorem of algebra. You cannot like have a lot of... But this seems to lose a lot of it. I guess your bound is quite... What's so, it, e to the minus poly? Yeah, yeah, it's e to the minus poly, yeah, yeah. So you're trading off the yeah, that gives, yeah. So you, you can pick the entries here. So this is a polynomial where the degrees are going to be like nd. You can find an like up to integers n, n times d plus 1. You can find everything. So the integers are not so big. But Gurwitz has a... Yeah, but there is a way which is not important. Yeah, so there is a way that's not important. Which is, yes. And we'll talk about it next week, right? Um, isn't yeah. that the cool proofs? Yeah. yeah, so okay. So yeah, I, I, I was going to advertise this. Uh, yeah, so... Okay, so we can find uh, nice matrices because you know we, we can uh, we can just use the fundamental theorem of algebra, and but Dirksen showed that you know remember we need an exponential bound, and this is a really deep theorem by Dirksen that it is enough to take d to be exponential in n here. Okay, so you don't need to look at at some dimension d. He gave an effective bound for the dimension of the matrices that you need to look at. Okay, and this will be important for us. But as Gurvitz saying, like we, you know, we tightened this analysis because we know this, this polynomial as well. We don't need Dirksen's bound, we just need Hilbert's finiteness. So all you need for... is a degree bound for the generating invariance. Yeah, we don't even need that actually. Well, this is the... That's don't... the cool thing. The cool thing is that like we are able to, you know, remove this and we are only able to use finiteness of degree. So it's... theorems are usually ineffective. I mean. Yeah, so they're ineffective and we don't need effectiveness here, yeah, yeah. So again, if you just know that there exist those Bs of some dimension, as much here, you will get that bound on the capacity. Yeah, so, you know, and that, that, and that will be presented in the cool proofs, okay, like next week. I don't know when, but we'll do it. So, okay, but here, let's just use the Dirksen's bound because it makes our life easier, okay? So we just need to take D exponential, and if we take D exponential, we can find this matrices B, you know, with size, with entries like N times this. Okay. What, kind, what kind of methods is he using? I mean, you don't have a proof of his theorem. Of Dirksen's theorem? Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, he used coy of, you know, this is, this is the general theorem that for any reductive group, like, this bound will, he gives an effective bound, yeah. His final proof, which is better, it's actually a combination of some linear algebra, those choice, choi that uh, iterations, and, and some combinatorics, yes. Yeah. But uh, yeah, there, there's some. Like, this is a general result. is is a really deep result. So um, and it was much more general than this. Oh yeah, it's much. Yeah, this is just Dirksen specialized to this group action. I mean, yeah, I'm saying you know. Um, okay. So now, if we put things together now in a nutshell, how do we analyze this algorithm? We have our operator t, and we know that capacity. Oh, is it different from zero there? Okay. So. Uh, no. Okay. So capacity is, uh, okay, let's say, let's negate everything, kind of everything here. So capacity is different from zero, if and only if my matrices are rank non-decreasing, which means that they are not in the null cone, okay, which means that there is a D 
such that this determinant is different from zero. So my matrix, is, I have a, uh, an invertible matrix. And I can find these Bs very nicely. OK? So the lemma is, OK, so take T1 given by this matrix is A1. Take T2 the operator given by this matrix is Bi that are different from zero. OK? And take the, op the operator T given by the tensor operator of T1 and T2. By the easy lemma, we have that the capacity of this operator is less or equal than the product of these two capacities. But if we normalize, right, we know that the, this capacity of T2, let's normalize our operators, T1 and T2, we know that this is less than or equal to 1, right? So in particular, the capacity of my original operator is less than or equal than the capacity of the tensor, square root of D2. Okay, that's why the degree being big doesn't matter so much, because we're taking that square root of the degree. And the lemma 2, which is what we proved, is that if I have an operator such that they span any variable matrix, then their capacity is lower bound by 2 to the minus n poly log n. Okay? So then this gives you a theorem that if t is given by a tuple of matrices which is ranked non-decreasing, so the capacity is bigger than 0, then it must be bigger than this quantity. Okay? So we get our effective bound. Okay? And with this, we get a polynomial time algorithm for uh, operator scaling. Okay? But what the cool thing is, is that you know, this algorithm that Gurbitz came up with Right? We can use it to approximate capacity. Right? We can approximate capacity within 1 plus epsilon multiplicative factor. And how do we do it? Well, I mean, every time you're scaling, you just keep track of the scalings. These scalings are multiplicative anyways. Right? You can keep composing them. And uh, there is another result as well that also Gurvitz proved, which generalizes something from the matrix scaling that means that if you're very close to being doubly stochastic, then your capacity is very close to 1. Okay? That's why if you scale to very close to doubly stochastic, you're also approximating capacity. Okay? And if you keep track of the scalings, you know that the capacity is the product of the determinant of all the scalings that you used times the capacity of your uh, original operator. So if you scale T0 to doubly stochastic, you have T0 times something that you know is 1 plus minus epsilon. Okay? One, between 1 and 1 minus epsilon. Right? Okay. So, you know, this can be used to approximate capacity, and it's nice and deterministic. Now, let's talk about Braskamp-Lieb inequalities, okay? So, what are those? Let's shift gears now. If you're tired now, you can come back. So, okay. So, essentially, Braskamp-Lieb inequalities are the following family of proposed inequalities, okay? So, I give you matrices Bi. Now, I'm on the real, so they, they map uh, Rn to Rni. Okay, these are surjective, so Ni's are less than or equal to N. And I give you positive numbers, P1 up to Pm. Okay, so my matrices are B1 up to Bm, and these numbers are attached to the Bi's. They're positive numbers. And we have the following functional inequality. For all integrable functions Fi, which are non-negative, um, okay, I have the integral of the product of Fi's when I apply Bi to X. So remember, the X lives on Rn. I'm shrinking it down to Rni and I'm applying fi, is less than or equal to some constant times the one of pi norms of these functions, OK? And essentially, uh, the question is, suppose I give you this, this BL datum, OK, this Braskem bleep datum, this set of matrices and these weights, OK? The question is, for which constant c does this inequality hold, if at all, right? So in, in, in simple terms, it's, how do we prove inequalities? I mean, we prove inequalities left and right. Some people do, do that for a living, right, Leonid? So we, you know, so how do we prove those inequalities, okay? So let me just, let's just see some examples of inequalities that fall within this framework. So for example, cauchy schwarz that we know and love, right? So for all integrable functions, we know that the integral of the product of f1, f2 is less than or equal than L2 norms, the product of the L2 norms, right? Holder's inequality, which generalizes cauchy schwarz is, again, the integral of the product is less or equal than the product of this one over pi norms, right? Now, some other inequalities, like loomis whitney inequality, okay? So suppose that I give you a body in three dimensions, and then I project this body onto every two dimensions, okay? Then the volume of this body is less or equal than the uh, cube root of the volume of E1, E2, E3, the volume of the, the area of the projections, okay? So if you look in pictures, which I should have done before, is, you know, there you go. You have this body, you project, and then the volume is less than or equal than the root of these three products, okay? 
So the functional version of this is for all integrable functions, fi of the projections is less than or equal to the L2 norms of the integral of the fi's. Okay, so you can see so how all of these inequalities are essentially subcases of Brask and Plebe. And so far, we've been very lucky that this constant here somehow is always one. It's kind of magical, <laughs> right? And there's another one, which is Shear's lemma, which, you know, again, generalizes Loomis Whitney, and there's an equivalent entropic version. But, anyways, I, this is just for us to see like, how these inequalities pop up everywhere. Okay? So, this BL datum, okay, the set of matrices and the set of positive numbers, will be called feasible if this inequality holds with some finite constant. Remember that C, if we can put in a C there that's finite, then we will say that this inequality actually holds. We have an inequality, right? And this optimal C that you can put in, in the inequality, which was one for all the other cases, right, will be called the Brask and Plebe constant. And I'll denote it by BL of BP, okay, BL of my datum. So, you know, the, the best inequality you can hope for is less than or equal than this BL times the product of the norms, okay? Okay, so Lieb, in the 90s, he proved that the maximizers of, you know, if this holds, like this will be tight, you know, when you plug in Fi's being Gaussians, okay? But now, if the Fi's are Gaussians, what happens? Well, you know, this guy becomes one over determinant of Y, and therefore you can come up with a formula for the Brascamp Lieb uh, constant, okay? So the Brascamp Lieb constant will be the supremum over all the a1 up to am, which are positive definite, okay, of this quantity. Need which to is, be finite, right? this huh? Yeah, if it is finite, if, if it is finite, is, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's usually what you're talking about, the, the sharp version. Exactly. So deciding if, if, uh, if a breast complete datum is finite is essentially deciding if the supremum is finite, right? right? It's still upper bounding this. So, you know, but if you remember the first half of the talk, Right? Like, this looks an awful lot like capacity. Right? Because you have, you know, some determinant here and maybe some determinant here. Right? So it's this ratio of determinants and you're applying something to this matrices AI. Okay, let's see something else that looks a lot like, you know, our problem. So in 2005, you know, Bennett, Carberry, Christ, and Tau, they characterize the set of maps of datum such that this uh, inequality such that the supremum, okay, such that an inequality holds, okay, such that this is bounded by some finite constant. And their characterization uh, was as follows. So if N, okay, so the matrices, remember, B, the matrices BI are mapping uh, N to NI, okay, and the P's are the other, the positive integers, or the, so the positive numbers. So this datum is feasible, which means that you have an inequality, if and only if the following holds. N is equal to the weighted sum of the Ni's, okay? And for all subspaces V, you have that the dimension of V is less than or equal than the weighted sum of these dimensions of BIV, okay? So... So condition one just says the sum is an integer. Uh, yes, but it's equal to N. It has to be equal to N. That's the dimension in for the second state. Yeah. Yes, yes. And, okay, and, you know, if you remember the shrunk subspace, right, this is also looking a lot like shrunk subspace, right? So, and an interesting thing about this, uh, this work of, of Bennett et al. is that, you know, if you fix just the matrices B, you know, the linear projections, the projections BI, okay, and you let PB be the set of all the P's that satisfy all these above conditions, Okay, this is a polytope. Okay, so which means that if I give you any linear transformations, you have an inequality if and only if this P's lie inside of a polytope. Okay, so you have some polyhedral thing giving you a lot of inequalities, right? Um, and you have obviously, I mean, you might say, well, but these are infinitely many constraints, but they're not really infinite because these dimensions are integers between one and n, right? So, you know, so you do have finitely many constraints. Okay. Now, okay, so it's looking an awful lot like capacity, sounding a lot like capacity. Now let's scream that this is a capacity, right? So in 89 and 98, Ball and Barth, they define this datum BP. It's called geometric if it satisfies the following conditions, okay? One, each BI is a projection, 
OK, so I have that bi, bi transpose is equal to the identity. OK, so each bi is a projection. And they satisfy this isotropic condition, which means that this weighted sum of pi, bi transpose bi, is equal to the big identity. OK? So, OK. Now, and what Ball proved is that if your datum is geometric, then you have an inequality, and your inequality has constant exactly one. So for example, all of the first inequalities that I showed to you in my example, they're all geometric datum. OK, so you can go and check, and you'll see that they're all geometric. And that's why it was always one. It was not luck, right? So now the question is, can we convert efficiently any feasible BL datum to this geometric case? Right? So if we could, you, we can try to show some finiteness algorithmically. Right? Because it was an open question in uh, BCCT if there was an algorithm which is not exponential to decide uh, whether the, the following. Well, they didn't even have an algorithm because you don't know how to, you know, you know there's a polytope out there, but you don't know how to define it because you don't know how to choose like, what inequalities will hold. Okay, you don't know how to pick the vector spaces. So they're like, is there any actually algorithm? Is there any effective procedure? Okay, let alone polynomial time. Is there any effective procedure that can decide if a datum is feasible or not? And with this description, they couldn't do anything. Okay? So, so we're in search of an algorithm, right? And one strategy could be, well, okay, I take a, if, if a datum is feasible, I can convert it to a geometric one. Okay? So, okay, so this gives us a scaling algorithm, right? So what is my datum? I have my datum BP. And what is going to be my algorithm? Okay, so take my collection of matrices. Okay, if they're not projection matrices, make them all projection. So you fix the projection case. Right, and you can fix by multiplying them all on the left. Now, now you're gonna ma you may mess up the isotropic position. But if you messed up the isotropic, isotropic position, then you just fix the isotropic position. Okay? Now you mess up the projection condition, and you keep doing this. Okay? So, okay, if you fix one, you disturb the other. But again, just keep doing this alternately. Right? So, and we're going to show that this works. And why? Because this is essentially capacity. Right? This is a screaming. Like this is saying, well, you know, Braskem Plebe constantly saying, well, call me capacity. Right? And so we're going to show that this algorithm of fixing projection and isotropy, it will work. Okay? But how do we analyze it? Well, and you know, usually in math, if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, we can prove that it's a dragon. Right? So, you know, we're going to reduce this to operator scaling. Okay? <coughs> So, OK, so how do we compute it? So let's, so we have our matrices bi and our numbers ci over d, OK? And now I have five minutes, so great, I can, you know, do the proof real quick. And the proof of this, OK, the intuition is, is the same, is in the same way how you kind of reduced, you know, uh, matrix scaling to operator scaling, OK? Matrix scaling is an operator scaling procedure because we came up with these operators, right? with the uh, matrices AI. So how do we came, come up with this a matrices AI now? Well, remember, we have these BIs. And each BI, if I put the Braskem Lieb uh, in a more capacity way, I have sum of PI. And then I have this BI transpose uh, AI. Right? And I have my infimum is over all this matrix. Let me put XI here. I have the infimum overall po positive definite xi, uh, bi over the product of the determinants of the ai to the pi, right? So let's suppose now that all of these pi's, they're just essentially 1 over d, OK? Let's just do this basic case. The rest you know how to figure out. So bi is equal to 1 over d, OK? So how do we construct these other operators? Well, notice that I need to get bi has to act on a different matrix, right? So let's suppose that we have a matrix like this, x1, x2, xm, right? So how does my operator, um, I have to come up with a big operator. How does this operator um, act on this matrix to only extract x1? Well, I simply put b1 transpose here, and everything's 0 here. So this is an n by 
whatever, ND matrix where I only put B1 here. Once I multiply, so let me say that this is C1. So once I multiply C1 times this big matrix X, okay, and I multiply by C1 transpose, what do I get? I get exactly B1 transpose X1, B1. Right? So then my operator will essentially be a collection of these matrices. C1 will be B1, 0, 0, 0. C2 will be 0, B2, 0, 0, 0, and so on and so forth. Okay? So that's essentially a similar reduction from, that we did from matrix scaling to operator scaling. We'll give you some quantum operator such that that operator is ranked non decreasing exactly when these conditions hold, and the doubly stochasticity is exactly the isotropy in the projection. Okay, so you get that magically for free. And you might think, wow, this is so elementary. Why didn't anyone see? Well, you know. Um, uh, and so now, from this reduction, we came up with an operator that captures the feasibility problem for the Brascan Plebe constant. Okay, but not only that, it captures, to comp it captures this infimum here. So I can actually compute, use my algorithm to approximate the capacity, to actually compute what the constant is. I can not only decide feasibility, but I can compute it in polynomial time. Okay? There's a polynomial time, but it's not really polynomial because you know, this D, the dependency in D is really large. That's why the ducks become a dragon, right? Because you know, it's not optimal. So, okay, so with this, we um, compute the brass complete constant and we decide finiteness. And you know, this reduction here, it looks very simple and very nice, but it has connections to quiver representation. So if you know what I'm talking about, if you don't, you don't need to worry about it. But this is essentially the reduction from the star quiver to the Kronecker quiver. Okay? So um, it's really nice. And we, when we did it, we didn't know, but we learned that it's exactly the same. And um, yeah, so there may be more connections there that are still not explored. So I'm going to finish with some open questions. And the question is, well, can we get more applications of these scaling problems? You know, we saw here for optimization, and we saw for even functional analysis, there's this unexpected application, right? And another question is, can we get different in new inequalities that generalize the capacity for non-abelian group actions? Because this capacity, in invariant theory, you can define in a much more general term, okay? And Gurwitz, he already has the capacity for hyperbolic polynomials like these inequalities and, you know, can we get more inequalities? Can we get some more inequalities for these capacities for even for operator scaling, for example? Can we have some van der Waarden conjecture for, uh, for operator scaling capacity? Okay. And what about general group actions? Can we get this van der Waarden-like, can we really generalize as much as possible this van der Waarden for um, using the variant theory? Van der Waarden not for capacity. Huh? Van der Waarden would be not for capacity. Let me, let me slide something under the rug, yeah. So, okay, cool. Um, yeah, and the other one is, well, can we get more Braskem bleep type inequalities for other quivers, for example? Okay, so these are open questions that, uh, yeah, we really don't know. And yeah, thanks, I'd like to. Questions? I mean, do you really, com have you computed new Braskem bleep constants? Yeah, yeah, we can. Well, if we compute it ourselves. Yeah, in other words, people are interested in uh, for specific cases and endpoint inequalities. I mean, uh, you just say in principle you can. Yes. Yeah, yeah, in principle we can, and the algorithm is very easy. I mean, the, the thing is, it depends on how the, the D blows up, right? But usually the examples we saw, the, the D is very small. The fraction is very small, right? So, so we can. Uh, have you made uh, any new theorem in... in like or just computing them. The, uh, people are interested in, other than the fact that it's in principle computable. Uh, no, but, but you can talk. About, you can tell me what it is, and I can code them today. So it's not. I mean, the algorithm is so simple. It's. Uh, yeah. I mean, we, we haven't. We haven't. I mean, like with specific P's, maybe the answers are quite simple. Yes. Yes. Yeah. No. Uh, like the P's are two. You know, some exponents I'd imagine. Exactly. If they all have a common denominator that is small, then definitely this algorithm runs really fast. That's the problem. And all the inequalities that we saw, they have this case, but we didn't. Uh, but all of them, we know what the Braskem bleep constant is, right? But I'd be happy to know one that people are trying to. You should ask me, not me. Okay. 
Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll ask him, yeah. Some people should start a company, producing new... Producing new brass can bleep constants, yeah. <laughs> Let's be rich. Yeah. So the thing, uh, suppose the capacity is zero, then can you find that subspace? Ah, that's a very good question. So, so the question was, if the capacity is actually zero, can I actually find this shrunk subspace, right? And the answer is yes, but not through what we do. We, we the analytic approach, we cannot find this, but in, at the same time that we gave this operator scaling um, algorithm analysis, there were another group of people who gave an algebraic algorithm to decide whether capacity is zero or not. And there, they can produce the shrunk subspace. So in a sense, yes. So we, we can, but not by this algorithm. It's a different one. It's by Ivan Yaschiao and Subramanian. Have you uh, seen the work of Costant and Dave and people like that where they analyze QR algorithm, which has got a similar flavor? Where you, when a diagonalize a matrix, you factorize it one way, you switch. And you just keep on doing that, and then, but they analyze it as a dynamical system. It's a completely integrable kind of thing. This that, looks a lot yeah, like that. I, yeah. I was thinking about that. So I think this is very simple. The, yeah, the, because the, it's not, conjugation the, is yes, hard. Conjugation yes, yes. is hard. I was thinking, but it's yes. similar, uh, there's a yeah, like yeah. action by conjugation. Yeah, but then, then yeah, so, very simple. Right, so yeah, but. Way more complicated. Yeah, but I think, yeah, I, th I think so. so. I analyzed the algorithm beautifully using Hamiltonian mechanics so as to see how quickly it converges. So of course, you don't have this pro problem here. Yeah, there you can always diagonalize. So. Yeah, yeah, no, but this is, this is, yeah, it's interesting. I think we now may be able to do it because now we have general group actions. We, we can do scaling for general group actions and then, you know, this is a scaling problem. We can do it. So yeah, we, but I, okay, well maybe we can talk about, I wanna know how fast can, can they do it, if they can beat. Dave, Dave has analyzed this QRL completely. Okay, so, okay, good, so we can talk about it later, yeah. So yeah, we can now, so but. LR or QRL? What's the diagonalization? No, I think it's Q, Q. Q. Okay, okay, before, let me just give some advertisements because we need more hits on our, you know, page. So there was an amazing workshop at the IS about scaling problems. You should check it out. Uh, go to IS and look for it. And there's a survey and the link is on my webpage about all this um, scaling algorithm. Sorry, the commercial, yeah. And also on Thursday, uh, Rafael will give a proof of that amazing inequality that you don't need to know the size. Yeah, two proofs on Thursday.